Welcome to Complexity Made Simple. My name is Paul Allen and the subject of today's newsletter, well, it's an answer to a question someone's asked me on YouTube and we're going to take a look at the cost of poor quality. In fact, we're going to take a look at the cost of quality, the cost of poor quality, and we're also going to take a look at the lean wastes. So let's have a look at these three subjects. We're going to look at the cost of quality, by the way, different, different to the cost of poor quality, the cost of quality, the cost of poor quality, and we're going to take a look at what lean gets up to, because lean really doesn't look at cost. Um, Lean likes to look at waste, which is a completely different, it's a completely different tack. Um, so we're going to look, we're going to look at these three areas, and I've deliberately put them in that order. We're going to cover them in that order. Uh, but the first one I want to cover really is the one that's it really I think is most important, and it's the cost of quality, because the cost of quality tells you whether you need something like Six Sigma in your company. And by the way, it doesn't have to be called Six Sigma. Um, you might just have a, you know, a project to dramatically improve quality in your company. And the cost of quality is going to tell you. So what is this thing going to look like? Well, it's a graph. It's a Pareto diagram, pretty much. And you're going to put on it three totals. The first total you're going to put on this thing, and this is probably going to be the biggest one, the cost of repairs, rejects, reworks, remakes, etc. Okay, anything that's a touch of the re's. We're going to work out in money, what is this costing us? So what's the cost of our mistakes, basically? Then the next one over, well, the next one over typically is the method that you use to try and prevent this one. And normally what you do is you inspect. And of course, this doesn't prevent this. What it tends to do tends to find this. So the more you do of this, the more you find of this. So if you put effort here, these things are going to be big, they're going to be costly, they're going to be expensive. So the cost of rejects, repairs, remakes, uh, etc. The appraisal cost, how much money do you spend just checking stuff? Because ultimately this is a sign you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, because if you knew what you were doing, you wouldn't have to inspect it after you'd made it. And finally, of course, the last category on the cost of quality, how much money do you spend on prevention? How much money do you spend on prevention costs? Making sure that you get it right first time. And that's the first thing you should look at. What is the cost? of quality because that tells you whether you need to take a look at something like Six Sigma, whether you need to take a look at the works of Deming, Duran, Schuert, yeah, whether you need to do a lot of work here to shift this diagram in the opposite direction. Now it could be your diagram is already in the opposite direction. By the way, there are great companies out there Toyota, by the way, would have a diagram in completely the opposite direction. They won't do Six Sigma. They've already said publicly they won't be doing it. They don't need to. They've got their processes under control. Okay, so, first thing, cost of quality. Then, of course, we come to this fine subject, the cost of poor quality, which really, of course, Potentially is just this one, although there is an argument to be said 
both of these are the cost of poor quality because if you didn't have it you wouldn't have to keep checking for it yeah so you know if you get rid of your defect rate this these columns here just disappear so potentially the cost of poor quality is these two here but actually there's a difference these two here are essentially what I would call known costs costs that you can calculate and quantify yeah? so the cost of your quality these are going to be internal efforts you're going to know how many repairs you've done you're going to know what your reject costs are like you're going to know how many remakes you do so this is going to be something that is relatively easy to calculate not only is it relatively easy to calculate it's not going to be a contentious number people are going to agree if you're throwing ten thousand pounds worth of material in the bin every year that everybody's going to agree that so these are known costs now of course the cost of poor quality um, what what are you going to use it for well mostly what you're going to use it for really is project selection and of course the other thing you're going to use it for is you're going to measure success with it All right they're the two they're the two main reasons that you work out the cost of poor quality because of course you've probably got too many problems down here you can't do them all at once you've got to pick some how are you going to work it out well maybe the biggest cost of poor quality might be the way however I have a problem with this because quite honestly the true cost of poor quality you're never going to know it you can never calculate it and the, the projects that you should pick the projects that have the biggest cost of poor quality the cost of poor quality is uncalculatable and here's the issue because if your cost of poor quality is with the customers and this is about dissatisfied customers the cost of a dissatisfied customer is uncalculatable you know you could get a dissatisfied customer and he, he, he could be 20 years of age and he could decide I am never buying from your company again you've lost them for a lifetime 60 years worth of business gone the same mistake could be made with an 80 year old maybe there's only two years worth of business left so the cost of poor quality you can never know the other thing with the customer you can never know who you've just upset you could have upset someone who goes on to be head of a major corporation who could be your biggest customer and because you upset that person when they were in a small organization you will never know that that business doesn't come your way because you let them down 20 years ago now this is not calculatable the true cost of poor quality you can do this this is straightforward money in the bin rejects in the bin what I tend to do with my clients I say look let's work this out let's make sure there's plenty of money that if we stop the money dribbling in the drain the money goes straight in your pocket cash in your pocket is a great project to do high defect rates we know that you know customers customers don't like defects yeah so it's easy to, to know that we're gonna we're gonna sort out dissatisfied customers it's easy to know that it's money in the bank but can I put the true cost to this now Motorola by the way let's just go back to Motorola who kind of started Six Sigma off in terms of the phrase and the, and the target etc that was their problem you know to, to Motorola you know poor quality was life and death to the company they needed to improve their quality by 1800 times this is their by the way this is their in market quality at the customer they needed to improve their quality by this much now you could say to them well 
what, what, what's this worth? If you, what's the cost of poor quality worth? And, and Motorola could have said, it's worth the business. You, we will lose the business if we don't sort this out. Because by the way, this is where their competition was. If they don't get to this. They don't equal their competition. They are literally toast. So every project you do, does it have the cost of poor quality of the total value of Motorola? Now, of course it doesn't. What it should say is, I've got some known costs, and what it should say is it's contributing to this in a major, major way. And, and that's what it should be doing. It should be talking about how it improves the defect rate. It can never work out the money though. It can never work out the money by improving the marketplace quality. So don't try, don't tie yourself in knots trying to work out something that isn't necessary. I don't do this, I work this out and I say this is really important for the, uh, for the biggest customer, for the success of the company, whatever. And I put these two together, this is a statement, this is money. You put the two together and it's a great project to do. Don't tie yourself in knots. And it's one of the reasons why I like Lean. Okay, so Lean, um, what Lean does is it doesn't go after money. Um, if you want uh, advice, by the way, on the best way to implement some lean uh, techniques, the Toyota Way Field Book um, by uh, Jeff Lycan and David Meyer. So the Toyota Way Field Book, that's my favorite lean textbook. Uh, in it, one of the things they talk about, don't go and work out the amount of money that you're going to save or not save from each lean implementation that you do. If you do that, you'll do the wrong things at the wrong time. Go and chase lean waste. Now, what is lean waste measured in? It's measured in time. It's measured in time and what they work out is the total flow time. From the point where you get the order from the customer to the point where you deliver it. Those two points, that's the total flow time. And what they do is they remove lean waste out of that and they compress the time, compress the time, compress the time, compress the time. And that's the way lean's done. Lean is not done about money. Now what will happen if you do that? You will become super efficient and you'll make piles of money but they're not, they're not chasing the pound, they're not chasing the dollar when they do that work. And that's a much better way to work. It keeps you more honest. So what you don't do, for instance, is you don't go and buy a cheaper supplier, but extend the flow time. That would go right against the, the, the target of the business if you're chasing away lean waste. You gotta find a cheaper supplier and compress the time at the, the same time. If you can do that, then it's allowable. If not, supplier's not allowed. So lean, different way of finding the projects. We're gonna take waste out of the flow time. And one last thing about flow time. Um, this, this is the one and only measure you need people talk about. And I think part of the question that I was asked uh, via YouTube, I was asked about the balanced scorecard. There is no such thing as a balanced scorecard. What you will do if you use a balanced scorecard is you will create tension. You will create conflict in your business. Some, some months you'll chase one number, one measure. Other months you'll chase another number, another measure, and you'll chase yourself around in circles. The best thing to do is to put flow time as the number one measure and everything else has to report in to flow time. And if you can't make the measure move in the right direction at the same time we're improving, improving the flow time, you can't do it. Everything is subordinate to flow time. And if you do that, you will all push in the same direction, do projects and achieve great things, and the business will just travel in the same direction constantly. 
and that's the way to do it. That's how to pick your, your projects. And by the way, this doesn't have to be about Six Sigma. It doesn't have to be about Lean. But your continuous improvement projects have to be selected. How do they have to be selected? Well, you could use cost of quality, cost of poor quality, or you could take Lean Waste out of the system. My favorite, even though I'm a Six Sigma guy, I love this one. Because this one, there is no argument about time. There is nobody arguing about what's the cost. What's the cost of dissatisfied customers? It's dead easy to work out. Yeah, so it doesn't, why take a hell of a lot of time here? There's no value in working this out in your business, really. You know, we want something that's simple, easy to understand, and everybody can push in the right direction. That's the cost of quality, the cost of poor quality, and lean waste. Look at this guy and make pots and pots of money.